have a moment of thinking, is enough being done about equality and inclusion at the top of your company, at the top of government, in culture? This is just one of the many sort of formidable fighting forces that are out there now on the front lines with you, flanking you, in a scrum with you, supporting you. So I love that this is a big panel because there is big support and flanking and scrum for this issue. So with that, I want to get right to the questions. I'll talk about each panelist as I ask them a question. I saw Karin last night at Hotel du Cop and I told her she was getting the first question. She said, ask me something interesting. So here goes. Karin is the CMO of Marriott, which now also owns Starwood, making them the largest hotel brand in the world. I want to start on the topic of how is diversity good for business? And you made a comment to me last night that you have something like a million hotel rooms in circulation in the world. And I imagine some very large number of those are inhabited by women or serviced by women or reserved through women. And I want to understand how you and Marriott and Al Starwood think about diversity being good for your business. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for the first question. I want to say hello to everybody. I can't see back there and over here. And uh, everybody, hold your mic close. Hold your mic close. So the conversation we, were, we had started really reminded me of uh, the privilege of getting to work in a business that is around uh, travel, which, you know, makes the world a more open place. Uh, you know, you're curious about other people. You open your mind. You learn about other cultures. It's really, it's a, it's a journey in inclusion when you go traveling, right? What, what's really interesting, it's a million rooms. It's 675,000 employees. And uh, many of those are women. And there's always been a philosophy at the company, which is really rooted in hospitality. And I would also say it's pro probably in the culture in this hotel, too, which is not one of our hotels, is, is making people feel comfortable. And that's really what it's all about, I think. Uh, you know, we definitely need to work on some of those numbers. I think 100 years of what was just said, that's going to take too long. But I think the rule of hospitality is to make others feel comfortable. Uh, the credo of one of our brands, uh, Ritz Carlton is we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. It's just it's, it's a very equal playing field that it's around making people feel really comfortable, making the world uh, about opportunities for people and bridging cultures, and that's been around for decades. Now that we have Starwood, uh, it wasn't a hard journey because it was also people in the business of making people feel comfortable, and so. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. I tend to look at it from a really global perspective around the idea that that's really all anybody really wants is to yeah. treat others well and to feel comfortable. And that's, that's really the ethos. So beautifully said. And I would say probably everybody on this terrace is in the business of making people feel comfortable. So I want to come to Antonio Lucio next, who is the rock star CMO of HP and has had a long career as a CMO. We know him from Visa. We know him from lots of other places where he's done groundbreaking work. I had this incredible experience this year where I happened to go to one of Antonio's major sort of marketing kickoffs for the year. And I knew him, I knew a bit about him, I knew he was an advocate for diversity and inclusion. But what really struck me is that Antonio, in like the second paragraph of his 30 minute kickoff to the marketing year, talked about inclusion as one of the most important tenants of what, what HP was doing as a company and its go to market. And I was so struck by that. I think about our everybody else's presentations, it's like, and we should think about diversity too. So Antonio, two things. I want you to talk about how it came to be that you are such an advocate for diversity and inclusion, and also how you convince the people around you that it's good for business. Okay, so first, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I feel right at home, surrounded by uh, smart and beautiful women. I have five daughters um, and, and three sisters. So. Uh, so that, that's the motivation to actually get diversity right. Uh, so so the, the, the whole concept started actually as, as a business imperative. And the business imperative has to do with the fact that the company had to reinvent itself. We split uh, two years ago, and, um, and we came to terms with the fact that from a marketing standpoint, the brand was very rational. It was understood through the brain. It was not 
loved. It, it needed a heart. So our two fundamental priorities was um, driving the innovation agenda and building on the emotional, on the emotional connection. If, if, you, if you take that as a business premise, you need to have a diverse team. A diverse team that drives the innovation agenda, a diverse team that is a clear representation of the customers that you serve. And over 50% of our revenue come from women globally. Our, our team, at the most senior level, was not represented that way. So over a 12-month period, we went from 20% senior leadership to 50% senior leadership. Having said that, it's not enough. The only way that you're going to transform this industry is through a holistic process. The clients need to lead because they control the money. The, the agencies need to follow with concrete, concrete plan of actions as opposed to words. And those actions need to be monitored and they need to be measured. And then the production process needs to also include, include, include women, which is the reason why we made the, um, we, we made the, um, the, 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 the support bidding for Free the Bid. And we actually have Elma, Alma Harrell here, who is the founder of Free the Bid. Round of applause. Can, can, can I give her two minutes to, yes. to see what she has accomplished in, in less than six months? Please, here, take this. Thank you so much. Antonio really has kept us afloat and alive since I launched this uh, six months, uh, eight months almost ago on my laptop. And we have a website that basically uh, now represents 400 women directors. And you can see their reels. We started with 80 when I met Antonio on Twitter. And then once we connected, he really changed my life and made it possible for me to advocate for women directors. What we do is we ask agencies and brands to commit to... Uh, get one woman director to bid every time they triple bid. And it has changed all the numbers. I just want to read to you a few really, really quick numbers so you could see what commitment can do for women when it's followed by, like Antonio said, both the client, the agency, and the production company. So, for instance, FCB, which is an agency that has really taken it and implemented it, has went from before the initiative, roughly 30% of all bids included a female director. Now they are at 95% of all commercials are bid by women. And that has raised women directors hired from 10% to 30%. So now 30% are, so this is just one example and we have other examples of another agency that have grown 400%. Um, and it's really thanks to people like Antonio and CM, CMOs like Visa well, was here, of course. Well. We also yeah. support Free the Bid. Yeah, they supported us from the start with Antonio. It's very true. And it's like really been kind of an amazing thing to have both of you. And if it wasn't for them, we couldn't have done what we did. So thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Since, since we're on Free the Bid, I actually want to ask Susie and Laura, who both participated as well, and there may be others on the panel, so you're going to jump in too. Talk about what it means to use your commercial platform, your pulpit inside an organization for this kind of advocacy. Laura, why don't you start? And let me just say, Laura, for anyone who doesn't know her, Laura Balash, the amazing head of marketing at Visa, my good friend, and I think wins the award of having been on this panel with me the most. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> okay, hi everybody, it's so great to be here. Um, so, talking about a brand platform and talking about reinvention, like Antonio noted, we have had the tagline, everywhere you wanna be. If you're in the US, you know that tagline, right? Please, raise your hand, okay. Thank you. You, be you better know the tagline. And uh, my former boss. Uh, and, you know, that was founded on acceptance of cards in retailers because we needed to be about accepting cards. Very rational, but really important. Landscape completely changes. Everything goes digital. You start paying with your mobile device. You start playing online with a couple clicks. We needed to change the definition of acceptance. And when we stepped back, we realized acceptance and everywhere you wanted to be was also about everyone you want to be. And that is so critically important when in the US, women make up to 80% of the buying decisions. So it's really a no-brainer when you think about it. So we have a large uh, legacy over 30 years with the Olympics, sponsoring the Olympics. And as we were heading into Rio 2016, we realized that a lot of things were happening in the world. 
a very divisive presidential election in the United States and a serious refugee problem in the Middle East. So we took the opportunity to redefine acceptance by sponsoring the first refugee team for the Olympics. And then we took one of the swimmers, Yusra Mardini from Syria, who is an excellent swimmer, but her story is really that she was on a boat leaving Syria with her family, escaping, the boat engine died, and she got out with her sister and swam the boat to shore. And so we told her story, a woman refugee, and that absolutely pays off what we believe everywhere you wanna be stands for. Amazing, amazing, love that story. So Susie, I'll come to you next because you were also an active participant. What I wanna say about Susie Deering is she very famously ran Moxie, a badass agency in Atlanta for years. We all know her or know of her for that. And then went in, a, in like what was a remarkable move, went to be CMO at eBay. So you go to a Silicon Valley company two years ago, year and a half ago, and you get there. So you're pretty new, right? Laura's been at Visa for nine years, Anton 11 years, long time. Antonio basically runs the place at HP. You're new, you're in, you've now joined a company in a place that's quite, um, where, where these issues are big. How did you get this done? How did you get advocacy for Free the Bid? Um, the great news is, is that it wasn't so far out from what we stand for, frankly, as a business. The beautiful part for eBay is, is that we at the core are absolutely focused on diversity and inclusion. However, we did find that post, so coming in, um, I've been now with eBay MS two years, and besides the fact of obviously moving into a company that was so well established, really created marketplaces under, you know, really invented truly mobile commerce. I remember being at Verizon at the time when eBay launched their app and thinking, shoot, how'd they do it? And we didn't. Um, and, you know, the interesting part is, is that when you look at even when Pierre started our business, he did it with one instinct, which was people are basically good. And there's something about driving a business with not your core component, which is that people are basically good. We don't think about that enough in our day-to-day -day life. I think that we take more of that. We don't come at it with a positive intent all the time. And so it changes your perspective very quickly. So if that's the case, if you really believe that people are basically good, then why are we doing so many more things to not actually embrace that as an industry? So looking across like two years coming into eBay, one, it was a massive move. I'm an East Coast, really a Southerner. I know you can't hear that, but I'm a real Southerner. And so making that move with an eight, no, 18 year old daughter who was taking um, the risk for a third corporate move in her second semester of her junior year. Oh. And, you know, again, talk about strength. I mean, you learn really quickly. But, you know, making that move, it was also so much dynamically changing. One, we're a marketplace which is constantly changing. The, the second thing was we just made the split from PayPal. We were in complete rebuild and remodeling, frankly. And so everything from scratch. So when I got the call from PJ that said we were headed into the holidays, we were ready, we were looking at work um, at that point to put TV, which eBay had not been doing in the past. And I got this call and he said, hey, there's this initiative. He couldn't even finish the first sentence. And I said, we are in, like we're all in, we're going. And I said, I don't, I mean, I'm not even, I'll make a phone call and let folks know, but I don't even need to run it up the ladder because it's so instinctively fit with our entire values as a business. So, and when we, we have the whole, Diversity means business. It is all about, for us coming back to, even our most recent campaign, Fill Your Cart With Color, we had three different directors, one of which even in that was a female director. And actually every single spot that we've shot, coincidentally, have all been females have been um, the producers and directors have been involved. So I think just you have to, we can say it, but if you don't live it and don't back it up, then it isn't gonna change. And it is gonna take 118 years and uh, eBay is not gonna stand for that. So you're, you're all talking about um, you can't just sort of say it. You have to do it. You've got to walk the talk. Meredith, Bank of it. So Meredith Verdone is the newly appointed chief marketing officer. Big round of applause at Bank of America. She's been there a long time and has risen sort of all the way up now to the top post. It is such a pleasure to see that. One of the things that's amazing about the bank is 
financial services industry, lots of, let's call it, traditional practices, um, yet the bank manages to be on you know, the 100 best companies for working mothers, I think like every year for the last 30, something like that. So how do you, how do you think about that in the context of what you do as a marketer? And uh, is this on? Yeah, great. And yeah, the financial service industry has historically been very male. And, you know, we all know the old joke, had it been, oh, is that better? Closer. Yeah. yeah. Um, had it been, you know, Lehman sisters, not Lehman brothers, <laughs> perhaps it would have been a different outcome. But it was, it's been just, it's a male dominated industry. And uh, I really give so many kudos to Brian Moynihan, who became the CEO in 2010. And we became the CMO. He held on to his role as the head of the Diversity and Inclusion Council. And that sent the message to the entire organization that this matters. And you have to remember, we're in one in two households. So we have to, and our name is Bank of America, so we represent the, we're the reflection of um, this country. Uh, our workforce is 50% women. Our senior management team is 40% women, and our board is 30%. So still some room to go. We're not 50 all the way, but tremendous progress. And we spend a lot of time with our policies as well. We've got a um, 16-week uh, maternity as well as paternity leave, which is equally as important that men get the 16 weeks so they can help the women while they're home. Um, but the point is it's equality in that view of that lens. And so when we think uh, about a lot of our marketing, we activate a lot of programs around diversity and inclusion. One, Special Olympics, which is really important to us. Uh, we employ over 300 people with intellectual disabilities, and this is something that we activate, most importantly, with our employees. Everyone knows someone who has an intellectual disability and is just such, an, and we did it in every uh, Every state that we operate in here, we had the torch run go through every market we're in, and people participated. And it's just heartwarming, and it raises the visibility of people with intellectual disabilities. Um, we did a lot. We partnered with the Ad Council on Love Has No Labels, which was so natural for us. It wasn't like a bold thing to do. It was natural. We have 30,000 people inside the company who have raised their hand to be allies to help people, uh, that, that um, population. So it's been just really, it's part of who we are. It's very core. And we also, uh, going way back with Antonio, uh, did the activation of RED, and this was in Africa, mother to uh, child trans, uh, transmission of AIDS. And again, this is helping that population of women, helping them uh, not pass on and help eradicate that disease. So again, it was a global issue that we wanted to get behind to help really show the power of helping women. So it is just so core to our internal uh, employee practices, our employee uh, engagement and activation, as well as all of our marketing programs. So what's so interesting to me about everything you just said is it's all about your employees first, um, and that's like how to think about it in the context of marketing. It's a whole other panel we could do. Um, Alicia Hatch, the amazing, I think second or third time on this panel. So happy to have you. Really cool background and very different background. So you spent like a decade in gaming at Microsoft um, and then very cool. Entre yeah. Uh, no men, no men in gaming, no young men, no young white men. Um, so, right, exactly. Um, so long time in gaming, and then you started your own, I wonder if it was a reaction, you started your own business, um, and I think you did some agency work as well. So now you're the CMO of Deloitte Digital. I want to understand, you've worked in a number of different venues, how does this play out differently at a big company in a space that's male-dominated versus your own company versus in a company now that really works totally in service to other businesses? You know, it's true. I haven't really taken a well-trodden path through my career. I love it. Which has allowed me, I think, to be a rule breaker. Every environment I was in, we were breaking rules. So even though I've kind of been from small to big, um, when we started Xbox, there were just a handful of people. And sure, I was one of the few women. But it was a pretty level playing field because it was operating essentially as a startup. And my startup itself, there's no hierarchy in a startup. So if you can get in, actually, it's highly democratic. And now being at Deloitte as the largest partnership in the world, 
it operates in largely the same way and we're breaking rules. I've always been in industries where we're redefining and I think that's made a big difference in terms of really looking at um, everybody participating as equal players, looking at really the intellectual diversity of, of everyone. You kind of are coming with not just your title, but your contribution and, and looking for the the project and not the promotion. And what am I contributing here? And that's made all the difference in terms of um, of my career. Amazing. And talk about diversity specifically. If you go back to the time that you were at Microsoft and you were in gaming, there's been a lot written about that. Do you think it's getting better? <laughs> not necessarily by the numbers. Yeah. But I do think that this generation of millennials has a naturally diverse mindset. Yeah. I think diversity is humanity. And I think that this growing generation appreciates that. And that is my hope, not just for gaming, but every single industry. Amazing. So we'll have to come back to what makes us more humane or younger people having more humanity. Um, Ali, I want to go to you. Um, particularly on the humanity point, you are presiding over, so you're the CMO now of Oath, and I want to talk about the name. Um, so the company that, I want to talk about it in a good way. The company that um, was AOL and Yahoo, so also a promotion for you. Oath implies the notion of a shared commitment and continued commitment. So how do you think about diversity and inclusion in that context? See, they're already applauding. <laughs> Everyone's just like, ah, you guys have been through enough. We'll just give you a, a token now. Um, so Oath is based on the notion of commitment, uh, a commitment for a couple reasons, a commitment to, um, I think, tr you know, in this industry, uh, creating something that's original, valuable, and very uh, human-led. I think we believe in that more than, uh, more than ever. Uh, a massive commitment to the employee base, not just from oath to its employees, but uh, how we expect everyone to behave together. Uh, in order for us, we're a house of brands, right? Everything inside the Oath family is everything from AOL, Yahoo, HuffPost, TechCrunch, Tumblr, uh, Makers. And uh, we have a very diverse set of employees. They all do different things. We also have a huge technology and data scientist team. And so what we expect are them to unite around something that is what we stand for. And when you look at our company and, and you know, Tim, who was the CEO of AOL, is now the CEO of Oath, uh, it's always, this has always been one of those foundations. When he joined AOL, it was separating from Time Warner, and we had nothing to lose, right? I mean, there was no, the, it, nobody thought AOL was going to resurge, let's put it that way. So we give him a ton of credit for that. But what he did was he uh, bought the Huffington Post, which was founded and led by Ariana. And still to this day with now Lydia Polk, sorry, sorry. Led by a badass <laughs> former New York Times yeah, editor. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Shout and out. she don't think she Has, doesn't remind me of that every Lydia time I see Polgren her. Polgren is awesome. Awesome. So, uh, but one of the only news organizations in the world that's been exclusively led by a female editor in chief. Uh, we he acquired and brought in Makers, which is uh, how many of you guys know Makers? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Makers is you know one of the things we're most proud of. Uh, we he started and funded uh, Built by Girls BBG Ventures, which uh, funds is a venture fund for female entrepreneurs and investors, and then also gets uh, young girls into our TechCrunch disrupt environment and uh, helps them judge what uh, Silicon Valley is doing. That commitment, um, that's one of the many commitments we've made, but when you think about how we brand this company, that's the DNA of who we are. And so um, that the commitment to diversity and inclusion in February uh, before we launched Oath, um, it was 50-50 uh, by 2020. Uh, top four levels of the company. Uh, when we say, say that one more time, <laughs> fifty. Yeah. So we made a promise uh, and an oath, took an oath rather, um, to uh, get to fifty fifty by twenty twenty for uh, oath go forward. And I will say, um, you know, my tenure, Tim's leadership has gone anywhere from sixty forty female to male. <laughs> 
uh, 55, down to 50-50, but until last week had never dropped below 50-50. Um, well, not so much, because we're below 50-50. Um, we, when we brought the two companies together, we, Yahoo transaction closed on Tuesday, uh, we went way down. And I think just to the point you were talking about uh, on Silicon Valley, um, it's a big issue. And so I would just say, and it's so awesome to hear everyone talk now. When you think about prior panels, and we've all talked about what we think versus what we're doing and the commitments. Yeah. And so when we think about Oath, like it is not our, it's not what we intend, it's what we commit to. And so more than ever, I would say, when I look at all the data, when I see what's happening, it isn't. There's this whole, oh, well, we had this conversation the other day about quotas, right? Like, oh, if you have a quota, then you're just going to hire shitty women. It's like, what? Yeah, right. Or you're just going to get women in to get women in, right? You're just going to get uh, diversity and race to get it in. Uh, it's absolutely untrue. When you have, and this speaks to, the, um, to, the, to your enterprise, when you have a resume at the table... Nine times out of 10, that resume is going to be as competitive or more competitive. Yeah. And so I would just say the commitments matter so much. Without the commitments, it doesn't happen. Don't buy into any of the bullshit around, oh, quotas are just artificial, whatever. Like, look at affirmative action. Look at any, I mean, there is no history that isn't written by something that's been written as a rule. So we Amazing. need to make the rules. Well said. And on your notion of the resume at the table, Jill, I want to go to you. Jill Cress is the new chief marketing officer, relatively new, of Nat Geo, one of the great, great, great media brands um, in the world. And you all are going through this massive transformation. I see some of your colleagues from Fox in the back of the room. You've got new ownership. And as I understand it, you are going through a total transformation of the company, the employee base, what they do. So how in real time, when you're trying to revive a business, make a business thrive, do you hold diversity and inclusion sort of in, in, in your mind and in the work, in the action, when so much change is happening around you? What a great and exciting question. Um, it's such an exciting time to be at National Geographic. Just to add a little context to the situation. So National Geographic is a brand that has been delighting consumers for 129 years. Um, but we are a one-year-old company. So it's kind of like being in the oldest uh, startup in the world. Uh, a year and a half ago, we entered into a joint venture with 21st Century Fox um, and the National Geographic Society. And it's a really amazing um, company with kind of an unrivaled sense of purpose. Uh, the for-profit venture directs 27% of its proceeds back to the nonprofit, the society, um, so that they can continue to do the incredible work of funding, explorers, and education to really make this world a better place. So. Just, just with that as context, then you say, we've got to build this brand, right? And it has been, you know, one of the most um, loved brands in the world, certainly very well, well known, but it's not, and it's very well revered, but it's not as contemporary and, and relevant as we want it to be. So to do that, we really had to sort of go back to say, you know, what is, what do we stand for? Like, what is this brand actually all about? And it's really about the incredible explorers. Um, some of them are here with me, um, and they are a very diverse set of explorers. If you get a chance to meet them, you have we have a, a submarine pilot here, a female submarine pilot, um, and two, uh, Erica Bergman, and two of our um, most um, passionate photographers. And I just learned that they are the number one and number two photographers in social media. Female photographers or photographers in okay, so. Um, they are amazing. And so diversity of, of cultures, of people, of what they do and how they do it is so core to this brand. And that's really important because for a brand to continue to, to sort of win the hearts and minds of consumers for 129 years, it must be doing something right. And I think that diversity of what our explorers are doing out in the world is really core to that. Um, and so that's kind of the jumping off point for how do we rebuild the brand? How do we embrace the spirit of these explorers and their diversity and these passion projects that they have around the climate and, and the oceans and things like um, elephant orphanages that are up in the Congo? Um, and how do we really sort of embrace that and really start to 
build a brand that recognizes that there is an explorer in all of us. And that is, I think, a really diverse thought. Um, so we're really excited about that. And I would say, you know, kudos to our, um, our leadership uh, at, within National Geographic Partners. It is, from a gender standpoint, incredibly diverse. I think 70% of the leadership team um, are women at National Geographic Partners. Um, and so it's, it's a really exciting time to be there. So that's, that is awesome. I'm very happy we got to numbers um, and to a little bit of the science um, here. So 70%, 50-50 by 2020. Um, you made a comment, Allie, that um, you gave the counter argument that people give when there are quotas. Antonio, I think you have a scorecard, if I read that correctly. Can you talk about that and give us like the, the real deal on was there pushback? How did you get that through and how does it work? Well, the, the, real deal is that, the real deal is that there's no choice. When you're the client and you pay the bills, there's no choice. But I have to say that the reaction that I got from all of the agencies, and by the way, my conversations were directly with the CEOs, was completely um, uh, open and, and, and encouraging. The one thing that we did is that they had to, they had to commit to the numbers based on, on where they were. So the numbers were no longer uh, HP demands us to achieve 50-50. It's this is what we're committing to. And the commitment was very specific about number of women in creative positions working on our account, number of senior women in creative positions working in our account, and number of lead strategy women working, working in our account. And we did, we, we did that uh, across, across the board. They, they were able to set uh, the targets. And then what we're doing is because there's a process that needs to be followed on a quarterly basis, and we've done two. We're at the six-month six month point right now. Twice, I met with all of the CEOs. This is what you agreed to. Let's see the progress in the numbers. Great. So I am happy to report, and by the way, in October, we're going to sit down with all of the CEOs, and we're going to report back the good, the bad, the ugly, and the extraordinary, so that everybody knows what are the, the big hurdles, what are the things that worked well, and what are the things that we should do um, more often. So far, all the numbers in terms of women in the creative department working in our account have moved up. In many cases, they were zero. Um, women in, in lead strategic roles have gone up. The one that we have not moved yet is the lead creative role. And that's the thing that we need to do next during the, during the, following, uh, during the following six months. So commitments actually work. The focus actually is really important and you have to measure, measure, and measure. Otherwise, this thing is not going to move. So commitments and a process. I love yeah. that you keep coming back to you need a process. I want to ask Meredith and Laura, you guys represent, you know, some of the largest media budgets, uh, creative budgets in the world. You do a lot of advertising. Meredith, I'll start with you. You, you have a new pulpit. How do you think about using that to sort of, you talked beautifully about what's happening inside the company. How do you use it outside the company? Yeah, uh, great. And I think you're going to continue to see us reflect the tapestry of our customer base, really. And we recognize that the average American family is no longer what we used to think it was. And you're going to see that represented in our understanding, the empathy of it. I mean, we just launched a... Um, a video that our friends in the back, uh, Sue De Silva, did on uh, for our travel reward cards that has uh, a couple check into a hotel and they happen to be a lesbian couple and one of them is going to get a uh, go to the spa. We shared that internally. No one even, it didn't raise an eyebrow. We didn't do it because it's Gay Pride Month. We did because that's our customer base. That is America. That's who we are. That's who we respect. And you're going to continue to see us represent the fabric of this country. I'll, you, that's amazing, by the way. That's a Visa card, too, so I love it. <laughs> Great partners. Um, I, uh, I'll talk a little bit about internal. Um, so being you did such a great job on the external, you know, as I was talking to you about technology changing everything and everything, frankly, we all do, but, you know, same with electronic payments. And what we saw was, you know, we're, we're not moving fast enough and our vertical organization was uh, keeping us from being able to do storytelling in real time. And so we took two layers out of the organization and we ultimately uh, had more direct reports going into the top jobs. And so it's very flat, flat organization. 
it ultimately allowed us to move more quickly, do better marketing, more effectively, more efficiently. But it also, interestingly, gave some of the women who did not always have a voice at the table a chance to get airtime and oxygen. And so what I've seen is more diversity of thought and thinking coming from women within our team. And so you have this wonderful byproduct from you know, what is happening um, around this whole movement. Um, and some of them are sitting here today, so kudos to them. Um, but you know, that, that's a great example, I think. Make the room for the women to be heard. I love that. I wanna, I wanna stay on a theme that we talked about a, a couple minutes ago, which is young people, and you're sort of implying that. You've got these people down in the organization who may be earlier in their careers, give them room. Karin, you have been very outspoken about the, in a really positive way for Marriott and the industry, about the importance of connecting with young people, millennials specifically, very differently. How do you think about diversity in that context? Yeah. Uh, and in addition to Marriott, I, I have many friends that are doing things. And hold are, your mic close and okay. shout into Thank it. Thank you. So uh, I, have, I have many friends who are working on this issue about youth employment. And so I listen to a lot of the, the statistics around the world around that. And I'm, I'm really delighted that actually uh, hospitality business is a route for, for many, many people around the world, route to employment and sorts of kinds of training. From a business perspective, one of the things that we saw early on, I've been at the company about three and a half years, we saw that there was this coming wave of travelers uh, that were millennial, and they, they sort of hadn't reached sort of peak travel years and sort of going out around the world. So we started to listen a lot to what was really sort of driving that. And really, it was about human connections and really wanting experiences, much more than stuff. Not, not to say that stuff's off the list, but it was really around really understanding the world and experiencing the world. And we spent a lot of time listening around the world to different sort of focus groups, different kinds of inputs. So inspiring, so inspiring. So it, it actually has really fundamentally informed how we communicate. So while we do do campaigns that are very specific to talk about our diversity and inclusion, we have a campaign we've been running for years called Hashtag Love Travels, where we we divert. We put a lot of um, effort toward telling stories that are very diverse around the world and doing event activation with many, many different organizations. But b beyond a campaign, one of the things that we've done is really used real-time activation that is happening in social media. We have newsrooms around the world called M Live, and we're listening into public conversations that are around travel, that are around what, what people are inspired by. And it really helps us sort of connect, like what do you want to try to get done? Is it is it something in business you're trying to get done? Is it something for your family you want to try to get done? And we engage in conversation in real time. So what we did is instead of just looking from our US headquarters perspective around youth, we started to think about, hey, let's make sure we have that diversity of perspective globally. So we set up these newsrooms, not only on the East Coast in the US, but in Miami for Spanish language, in China, uh, and in London. We're soon to have one in Dubai. And around the world, really, the conversation kind of connects the dots around what's sort of true around everybody. And it's, I have to say, it's a really inspiring thing. So that when we're talking about what role we can play in fueling experiences, we're, we're talking about authentic conversations that are real in their lives, not necessarily what we're trying to push. I have to say, it's really fundamentally changed how we communicate and, and we create content around it. So I love that. Um, you're, I'm hearing all of this unbelievable, uh, I'm hearing about a lot of progress. Um, I think there are many of us, including all of us sitting up here who would say, so much progress, not anywhere near enough yet. And so I wanna ask a jump ball question to the group, which is, if diversity is so good for business, what's holding us back? Is it unconscious bias? Is it other things we're seeing play out? And I just want to ask which brave soul wants to answer that, I'll Antonio. Uh, the um, what what the resistance to change? Change is hard. Uh, I had the opportunity yesterday to uh, to spend some time with Reverend Jesse Jackson, and and someone asked him, um, wh what were the lessons of the civil right movement that could be applied to what we're doing here? And he said, well. The key lesson is that we not only had great words, we had a lot of very good, specific actions. And the problem with our industry is that we are talking too much, we're doing too little, and we're not moving fast enough. 
Love that. Laura. I would say, I think why sometimes progress gets held back. By the way, that's amazing. Reverend Jesse Jackson. So. You were with Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> This is what happens when you're on a panel with your old boss. Um, but I think what happens, too, is we delegate it to HR. It, you cannot do that. You have to take ownership. The C-suite has to take ownership. You know, you, you cannot. It's not HR and a diversity chief diversity officer who we love. You know, they, they alone cannot do it. Add to that is that we talked a lot about younger populations of people and talent, and we find that there's an expectation among the younger people we bring in that we are going to be a diverse place, that we are going to stick by the commitments, that our values will represent the type of place we'll be to work, and it's very important that you have an infrastructure uh, to the point of commitments that you can measure that are very transparent about that. So it's change is extremely hard and it's awesome and easy to talk about change. Totally different ball game to act on it. And so the commitment and the metrics around the commitment, if that transparency is not there, I think it's a big talent risk as well. Yeah. yeah. I just jump on that too in the sense that, you know, we're, I think there's a couple uh, themes here. When you're talking about a lot of brands that are trying to go through transformation, I think there's a reason for that. Because if you think about it, if your brand hasn't transformed, it probably is because we haven't brought in diversity of thinking. We haven't necessarily thought about, you know, we had this aha moment. Why it was such an aha moment was, oh, man, we don't have enough younger people sitting around our table, yet we're trying to act like we're a younger brand. And, it, you know, I'd like to think that we have all that spirit. But I think it goes, again, I, I totally agree. It's not one person's job. It's all of our jobs. It's got to be that we hire people in that are going to hold us accountable to that. Accountability is something that I think too many people run away from. The numbers do matter, but don't let the numbers actually keep you from the, the actual action. Because I think sometimes the numbers can create fear, and the fear will absolutely hold us back. So again, be intentional about it. Make sure you're holding people accountable to it. Think about the reason why maybe you're in that rut or in that kind of transformation place that maybe there's other factors besides just how you show up. I love that. Um, you all have shown up to help this group think through and help each other think through what should we be doing. I want to give you all a few minutes to ask questions. I will say after we do that, we'll come back. And my lightning round thing that I'd like you to each answer is either you can choose one. What do you commit to in front of this group toward more action, which you've all said or what's the one lesson you didn't get to share that you wish this group would take away? So I think we have mics. People want to ask questions. Please introduce yourself. Um, if you do, Alan has a mic. It's, yep. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Jenny Evans. I'm a reporter from Quartz. I'm wondering for, here, hi. Um, I'm wondering for people in an organization who maybe aren't, either in like a C-suite position or in HR, how you think you can sort of start to change the culture at a growing company or create a culture that, you know, like you were saying, it's easy to say that you're committed and the numbers are important, but not everything. So what are other things that we can do? I have one. Uh, one of the things that I found was really important, uh, particularly bringing in a younger workforce into the marketing organization for a company that had been around almost 90 years, was something as simple as the buddy system. Having somebody who's been at the company even just a little bit longer, have a friend they could ask a bunch of questions of or potentially collaborate with, it really helped demonstrably people feel more courage to raise their hand, uh, move an issue forward, believe in something that they really wanted to do when they felt like someone had their back, right? And so I, I really believe in this. It, it certainly started with the younger uh, teams. We just went through an integration with a merger. And some of the more seasoned folks, we've been like, well, find a buddy, you know? So buddy system, I think, is really key to help push wherever you are in the organization. I really believe in that. I have a question. Um, so like I said before, my, my initiative is very much a grassroots thing that I started on my computer. And thanks to Twitter, I got connected to Antonio. And thanks to Antonio, I got connected to Lara. And now I know these two great CMOs who are changing lives of all women directors. And my question Aww. is, seriously. Aw. Uh, seriously. <laughs> and then again, uh, what, is, what is the best way 
as somebody that starts a movement like that and isn't connected in the corporate world to reach other CMOs and let them know about the work that we do because I feel like I put a lot of weight on Antonio to introduce me to people and I would love to get your advice on it. Well, I would offer to you... <laughs> I would offer... Um, so I know you came up to me after the Stevie Nicks concert um, on Monday night and I was admittedly a little overserved Monday night. It's been a rough few months, so I apologize, but your card is in my bag. Um, but I'd say Makers is a great platform for you, and we're happy to put that whole network to work for you if you'd like. Yeah. Is that your commitment? That's my, well, no. My, well, well, first of all, if you're going to make an oath, I would rather it be in three words. So that's my, own, that's my oh. addition. But yes, I'll make that commitment. Chief. Love they that. Like Love that. Yes, one more question, then we'll do lightning round. Hello, I'm Melissa Drucker. I run sales for Tastemade. Hi, by the way. Um, Hi. But I guess something for me as a female in the business is I set up a, a paternity, maternity policy at my company or startup. I was really proud of doing that, but no one's touched on this, and I'd love to know. I have a six-month-old and a six-year-old. How do you do the work-life balance and still bring that diversity to a company and ensuring them that you can do both? So that's a great question. Who's killing it as a mom? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I think, you know what, it is, um, I think balance is the, the word that's really tricky in that. And I think it's really, for me, and I have a 17-year-old, and we have, um, I think, you know, sort of realized that it's actually, it's kind of, it's like a pendulum, right? And I think it's when we sort of recognize that and really leaning into those moments where you can be more of a mom, because there are plenty where you are, um, you know, absolutely torn away. But with with the opportunities that you have when you have children and a career, I think you can really also show them the world. And so one of the things that we've really embraced prior to work, working at National Geographic, I was at MasterCard, I feel like I'm you know, back in financial services on this panel, um, was the opportunity to live abroad and to travel and sort of embrace the great things about these jobs that we have to expose your, your kids and your family to, to other cultures. And to me, that's been a really great way to sort of achieve balance um, through what I do, which is sort of bringing my family into some of those experiences. And I mean, oh, go ahead. Go, Maybe this is my thing. I'm leaving because I, I I had uh, two uh, babies in 12 months, and when I came back from the second one, I was not going to be a high performer. Like, there's just no way. <laughs> and um, I had a boss who told me that, and which was helpful. And but the point is, <laughs> anyone knows my boss. Um, but the point is, I wasn't going to kill it then. You have a long career. Yes. You need to know that you need to have that conversation with your boss and recognize it's all not going to happen at once. And you're not going to be brilliant every day. And so I was not brilliant for a little while. I didn't get sleep. But I'm the CMO now. But at the time, you know, 17 years ago, I was having two kids at once and I was not the highest before. So you just have to take it to say not every day you're going to kill it. So I look at it balanced longitudinally over the course of your career. Balance is so important. Yes, I have four boys, ten and under. There we go. And <laughs> you have to choose the moments that matter. You can't do everything at work, even if you have no children. You can't do everything at home, even if you have a big job. You have to choose what actually matters wherever you are. So I play a little psychological game with myself about what makes me feel like a good mom. I choose to take the first day of school off because I feel like a good mom when I do that, right? And, and these things give me energy. So it's finding that balance that is really personal to you, right? I just want to add, I know that just uh, piling on. Number one, set priorities for yourself and tell people about them. Do not shy away from being transparent about what matters to you. And be transparent when your, your priorities maybe get out of balance. You know, I'm very transparent with my team to a point probably sometimes they're like TMI because, I mean, it just, you gotta set those priorities and then you gotta set, you gotta set guardrails. You're not gonna, you, you gotta be in the moment, but at the same time, just be true to yourself. 
and tell people about it. Tell people about it. With that in mind, Karin, let's start with you. Lightning round, lightning and then round, we'll wrap. Round. Uh, I think I'm just going to say something about inclusion. I, I totally agree with the, the panel talking about the importance of initiatives and commitments. We also have scorecards there. Uh, a good lesson and just a reminder that I've learned, I wanted to share with this group, is that inclusion is also a feeling. It's definitely an initiative, but it's definitely a feeling. And uh, making people feel uh, uh, included and recognized and, and present, uh, really super Super important. Um, so I think it's really getting down to the numbers. I love the idea of the dashboard. I think we're doing a ton to foster diversity, um, certainly of demographics, but also I, I also believe diversity is you know what you do and and how you do it. So it's it's not only celebrating those differences, but actually holding ourselves accountable. And I think we're a little bit light on the metrics side of things. So that's going to be my key takeaway. Uh, I would say, I, I, I haven't, we haven't talked about this, but so there's probably some people in the room who are like, yeah, the hell we're not going to do that. But I think we are going uh, to try to, you know, we have now 5,000 employees in Silicon Valley that we didn't have as of last week. And so I think we're going to try to make a dent in Silicon Valley. Love that. That's great. Um, I would just say, and also we haven't really talked about the, thankfully, the political environment, which is just a, a rough environment that we're in right now with different perspectives out there. And I think to me, it's just a broader issue of, just valuing their different perspectives and ensure if you're in places and meetings where people, first of all, aren't talking, I think it's our job as leaders to get people to talk and just to recognize there are different perspectives. Just take that on yourself and encourage people to bring up the different perspectives. It's great. We've talked a lot about big goals, which is really important, but getting to those big goals tends to happen in a series of small moments. And I know she wouldn't mind if I shared this. I sat down with Deborah Bass this morning, We were, and she's the president of Global Marketing Services at Johnson & Johnson. We were talking about her career, and she actually was saying that at every single stage, it's been a small moment that maybe someone else didn't realize was really big for her when she was a junior copywriter and someone told her she had good copywriting judgment to now Allison Lewis is the global CMO telling her she's awesome. Yeah. And I was with Allie earlier this week. She handed me this maker's bracelet and it was nothing to her. She probably has 50 in her room. But just know, like it was big. To, I'm just saying, okay, I, you know, like it was like you can do this. And so know that those small moments can have big impact. So what you can do is, you know, embrace those small moments in, with the people around you at every stage. For yourself and for them. Amazing. Laura. Yeah. So um, I'm going to build off what you're saying a little bit. I'm going to really ensure that I'm taking time with the women around me to remind them to be brave and take risks. I mean, my career has gone the farthest, the quickest, when I've taken really risky jobs. Uh, and so, you know, and that's, that's, it's scary. It is really scary, but I, th I wish someone would have told me that a little earlier, so, so I will encourage women around me, be brave take risks. Laura, I'm going to take a risk. Was this as much fun as talking to Gwyneth Paltrow? <laughs> Don't answer. Antonio. <laughs> Way more fun. Way more fun. Right on, right on. So the, the one thing that I, that I want to talk about, because I, I need to represent men, men in this panel, is um, please don't be afraid to talk to us. Yeah. Please awesome. be, don't be afraid to share the way that you feel. We are problem solvers. We are going to help you for the most part. And in doing so, we are going to get, we're going to become better people as well. That's great. Because we need to learn how to share more as well. So that's, that's my, my, my insight. Awesome. I've had the benefit of having five daughters, a wife, a mother, and three sisters. <laughs> and, awesome. and, 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 and I've learned so much about myself just by listening to them. And um, so that's my that's my insight and that's my invitation for the group. I love that. Um, it is good. And to the eleven women in his life, that's right. who made him say that. I love that. <laughs>
Um, one, my commitment is, is that we are going to create a scorecard and we're going to have visibility to real metrics and hold our partners accountable just as much as I know that we're being held accountable internally um, to change the numbers and make our part. But in addition to that, I think going back to kind of, you know, people are just inherently good. I think we need to do more each day to find the good in people and to bring that out, whether that is male, female, across the board and in diversity, because the inclusion component of diversity is absolutely critical. Amazing. So my commitment is to Shelly, and that is that every time we wrap up one of these panels, and we're four or five years in, and probably 25 panels in, we are going to save how we wrap, and we are going to track the progress over time on the issues that we're talking about. So let me quickly say. Let me tell you what else we're doing with it. We, we added a new twist. Uh, Meredith is hearing it for the first time here, but we've been doing Girls Now just for over five years now. And at least in the last two years since the, I, this became my full time, whatever it is that I do, I'm not sure. Um, we went and edited all of the videos. The videos are all an hour long, which, you know, are amazing to watch and our mothers might want to watch the every minute of it, but we've taken now 30 second bites from each of you by topic, so that it's by topic, by date, by person, um, and we're turning it into an equality advisor chatbot powered by artificial intelligence. So we now have thousands of 30 second bites over this period of time because your knowledge, you know, we always say if you want to know something, just ask her, ask her, ask her, ask her, ask him. The collective of wisdom, you know, the collective of knowledge is lifelong lessons of wisdom. And so I think that, you know, these are this these conversations are so important in every way. And I just want to say you can have diversity, but it doesn't matter if you don't have inclusivity. And I think that when we talk about diversity, you know, and inclusivity, Inclusivity makes diversity work. And we need to start thinking about you know, these expressions. And when we talk about work-life balance, in here we say there is no such thing as balance. You have one life with many dimensions. And it's about integration. You know, there's five dimensions. There's family, there's work, there's friends, there's community, and there's yourself, which we always neglect because we are always so gracious helping everybody else. And at different life stages, you might not be able to do all five at the same time, so don't be hard on yourself. Pick and choose which slices of that pie you can deal with and how big each of those elements can be and live in the moment, and it, it'll go a long way. And so I just, before Meredith wraps, which is the highlight of everything, and you're not gonna believe how she does that, I really want to say, Antonio, you had us at Hello, and you are just so <laughs> Adorable, and so you get the present. Um, Antonio's present, feminist. But we put the word men in feminism because modern feminism must include men. We for we. That's for you. Thank you very much. mic back. That's great. And by the way, we all want a shirt. Um, so. Awesome. Awesome. Karen started us out beautifully by saying we are all in the business of making people feel comfortable. Antonio told us if you want to win hearts, you need a diverse team. Laura said everywhere you want to be is about people feeling included everywhere. Susie, I loved when you said if you really believe people are good like her boss does, it's easy. Meredith told us it has to start at the very top as it does at B of A. And also, I love walk the talk first with your employees before you decide to tell the world about it. Alicia said, this was so good. Diversity is humanity, which I'd not heard before. And I love that. Ali said, and this is so striking to me, what do we think AOL is? We think it's a tech company. What do we think Yahoo is? We think it's a tech company. And she said, our new company is human-led, which may be the opposite of that. I love it. She also said, which made us think really hard, 50-50 by 2020, and it's not what we attend, it's what we commit to. 
Antonio said in everything he said, you need a process that you can hold people accountable to. Laura, you said it on many panels. I want you to say it for 10 more years. You have to give women oxygen to get them to, to get to actually hear their voices. Antonio quoted, talking too much, doing too little and not making enough progress, which I loved. Mayor, we always get, the other Meredith, we always get on this panel someone who makes us answer, and I think it is so right, the question about how do you do it? So what? how do you handle balance? It's just not gonna happen all at once. You're playing a long game. And I will give the last point to the combination, the collective wisdom of Karin and Shelley. Karin said, inclusion is a feeling. And when you said that, the amazing, inspiring, badass Shelley Zalas walked over to me and whispered in my ear, it's also a mindset. So Karin, Jill, Ali, Meredith, Alicia, Laura, Antonio, Susie, Shelley, thank you. And this was much fun.